I'll take that I didn't miss anybody. Okay. So Dr. Borowski, I will turn it over to you. All righty. Um, well, I uh, want to welcome everyone to the uh, dental TAC uh, meeting. And um, I, I did send out reminders and uh, uh, agendas to all the TAC members. Now, Dr. Phil Schuler was the only one that I heard back from that was not going to be able to be on the call today. So that should have still left us with Dr. Gray and Dr. Petrie. So we'll, we'll, uh, we don't, we don't have a quorum just yet. So um, we'll maybe give them a few more minutes to get on here. Um, I'm on. Uh, this is Joe Petrie. I'm on. Okay, good. Just, Thanks, Joe. Try, trying to get my unmuted to, to talk. So sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry, Joe. I missed you when you popped in there. Uh, that's okay. Just making a note or two here. Um, There. Dr. Joe, had you heard from, from John or anything? I hadn't heard from him. I, I haven't. I haven't heard anything from him. I can, well, I, it kicks me off video when I text him, but I can send him a text to, to see. Um, Let me see. Maybe I can text him here real quick. Um, I just I just texted him so we'll see what we got here. <clears throat> Miss Nicole, I, you were talking about the a garden at your church. I know uh, um, one of our churches close to us, they, they've got the same thing. They've got a, a garden that they, uh, you know, just kind of grow it for the community. And then they'll take some of their produce down to the, we have a food bank uh, yes. here, here in town. So that way they can get some, you know, kind of like just some homegrown vegetables. and Yeah. Uh, Yes, yeah, we do something similar to that. Our church is a, it's a um, really country church with it in the middle of a, um, of a um, cornfield. So yeah. we have the, the corn that's growing right next to our, our um, little garden. And um, so we get some really interesting insects <laughs> yeah, in so. the garden and the little moles, you know, that, that run in and out. But fortunately, we're still able to produce, you know, a lot and, um, and give it to the, 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 um, the, the, the other members of the church. So it's fun. And I learn a lot because there's um, multiple people that work the garden. So you kind of get little tricks and trades from everybody. So, yep. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. But I enjoy my garden. Unfortunately, my my thesis team members have to hear about my garden all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I see my pictures. Yeah, last year it was the um, possum that got into my garden and I could not figure out what was doing so much damage but my neighbor saw the possum climbing over the fence. I have chicken wire around mine also. Yeah. Um, so it climbed over the fence with the, um, with a zucchini in its mouth <laughs> and then had the nerve oh, to eat the zucchini in my yard. I'm like, how rude. Just rude. <laughs> we had a John's iPad login. I don't, or iPhone. I'm not sure if that's who it might be Dr. Gray. Yeah, it sure is. That might be. Is it okay? Yeah. He just he just uh, just messaged me back that he says working on getting in. So if you'll let me know when he does get on there, we'll. 
Nicole, I have to say, this is Lee Geist. That's a great visual you put in my mind. A possum climbing over in chicken wire with a zucchini <laughs> in its mouth. Yeah, I wish I would have had a picture. I did. I didn't get a. She she didn't get a picture of him, but I did have the zucchini that he didn't finish. Um, in, in the yard, like just at least finish it. You know, just at least finish it. But the squirrels do that too. They'll take a chunk out of the um the the tomato and then won't eat the rest of it. It's like I don't I don't understand. Just finish it. It's the, you know if you're gonna if you're gonna destroy it, just take the whole thing. Don't just eat half of it. But it's fun. It's fun. How are you, Lee? I think he's logged in, not to cut you guys off, sorry. Great, no, that's okay. fine, I'll talk forever, so I'll stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> One thing about possums, though, they're so ugly that you want to always avoid them, but don't kill them. They, they'll they eat about 5,000 ticks yep. out of your yard each exactly. year. Exactly. Leave them alone. <laughs> yeah, leave them alone. <laughs> yep, okay, is, uh, is Dr. John uh, logged in here officially now? If he's John's iPad, I believe that's him. Yes, that he said he was he was going to be working on getting logged in here. <clears throat> Dr. Gray, are you on? Aaron, he's got to be on the video before he counts. I know, thing. that's why I was trying to see if he was on, because it just says John's iPhone, so I'm not 100% positive who that is. Well, he's, he, he just said he's, he's covering in Georgetown, and he needs instructions on how to get on. Um, I, to me, the easiest way was to get on that uh, tag site and just click join. This is Jonathan Young with with Melina, it's probably my phone that's registering that you're referring to. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me text John real quick, see if he can get on there. Um, well, send, him, send, him, send him a link to the, uh, the tax side. So we just click right on it. Yeah. Um. I just forwarded him my calendar invite. So if you want him, let him know he should get an email from me. Okay. Okay, I just sent him that reminder. To look at his e a new email there. He said he's having to cover at a different office today, and uh, he uh, he probably like a lot of us uh, having uh, staffing issues. Uh, the uh, let's see. Um, I had another dentist in another town just up the road from us here yesterday texted me, said, do you, do you know of any, any assistance out there available? And, um, and I, I, let me get this here. Nicole, I just sent him that, what you sent me there, so. Okay, that's, that'll work for him, and that way he doesn't have to go into anything else. He can just click on it. Um. 
my main hygienist is off having going to have a ro torn rotator cuff surgery next month, Tuesday or Wednesday there. And so she's been off all week. And so she's going to be out for several weeks. And we're, we're just kind of having to, you know, patch and fill and see which days we even have a hygienist. Let's see if John's having trouble here. Let's see. How's staffing going with provider reps? Are we seeing any any increase in being able to have more coverage for uh, for providers? Is that a question for DMS or the MCOs? I'm sorry. I would I would say for the MCOs, uh, most yeah. of them. DMS, DMS doesn't really have provider reps, so that's always MCO. Okay, all right. Um, is it uh, for the DMS team, do we want to wait till we formally start the meeting or um, do you want us to address that? I don't want to get in trouble. You, you can wait, that's fine. When we were small talking, uh, uh, Killing time for John, but it but it's an important it's important conversation to have. I was just uh, I I know that you all uh, also are having the same struggles we are with with that, but we'll we'll wait on the meeting for it. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. Dr. Bobrowski, we could always start the meeting, and if he joins, you can come back, um, establish your quorum and approve your minutes at that point. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's do that then. Uh, I guess John, he's uh, quit, he texted me there now, so we'll see if he can join the meeting here in a second. But um, we could go ahead and do the, uh, part of the old business was to continue some of our MCO reports on the social determinants of health and their impacts on oral health and total health care. And uh, I believe we were gonna get a report from uh, Molina Passport, Aetna and Humana. So uh, uh, Molina, if you all wanna go first, um, if you're ready. I am ready. I'm ready. This is Dr. Sherry Babbage, Melissa's way with Molina Passport. How are you? I'm Great. trying to push all the buttons I need to push and get this presentation uh, loaded up. Just go ahead when you're ready. All righty. Let's see what we can do. I will we'll turn the camera off, but I wanted you all to see what I'm like. <laughs> Here we go. Do you all see my presentation? Gotcha, yep. Okay, perfect. I did it right for a change. Make sure my buttons are working. Um, all righty. Let's talk a little bit about the things uh, of why we do what we do. So when we're talking about our social determinants of health, um, we're talking about I gotta move this off my screen. I'm so sorry, guys. I can't see my presentation. I see your all's pictures. There we go. Um, so it's important that we take a look <clears throat> at all aspects of a person's health. So traditionally, this has included physical health, of course, behavioral health, and dental health. In recent years, however, there's been a greater understanding of the importance of um, the social determinants of health as a significant influence on the overall quality of health and life and well-being. You know, I think we've all these years, we've treated social determinants of health, but now we actually have the term that we can use, something we can go to, and I think it makes it easier for us to be able to put everything into a basket where we can make the patient better. So what Passport has been doing, um, we have 
uh, health risk assessment that we provide annually to all our new members to complete. And on that assessment are social determinants of health. So some of these responses that our patients, uh, our clients, members give us uh, trigger a referral to our case management team. And once it gets to our case management team, uh, there's additional screenings and additional assessments that we can do to narrow down exactly what those uh, needs are. So we have this protocol and we call it PREPARE which stands for Protocol for Responding to and Assessing Patients' Assets, Risk, and Experiences. So this is a way that uh, we can screen all our members and identify them for care management on their social determinant health needs. This helps us better understand and address our members' health and the best way we, we want every one of our members as healthy as they can be. So by ass assessing their needs, we can help them achieve their goals. So uh, Passport employs individuals and that focus on the social determinants uh, of health needs within our members. And some of these um, individuals are our community connectors or community health workers, housing specialists, and peer support specialists. So Passport will address the social determinants of health at the population health levels in many ways, including um, we like to uh, offer value added benefits um, and, and we um, make donations to community serving organizations. So for example, uh, social determinants of health related value added benefits include GED assistance, um, incentives, food kits, uh, gas and bus cards to get to where you need to be, and dentures. And then everybody knows when they have a member that is needing care management, how to contact our care team. Um, for example, our value-added dentures, Passport will pay $300 for a partial set or $700 for a full set of dentures. Our members, however, we make, give them a little responsibility in, in the system to participate in care management. So they have to be a participant. You can't just say, oh, I want dentures, and, and there it is. But we have things that we want you to do. We want you to be healthy all the way around. So <clears throat> this is a new benefit uh, for our Medicaid members. It just went into effect in 2022. I have... Um, a, a graph down here, and you can see that 178 members from 60 different counties have requested this benefit. The largest portion is from Jefferson County, and 28 of those members reside in the West Louisville, our poorest neighborhood zip codes. So, and it looks like most of the, the requests have come from Caucasian females. So, and around the age of 50 to 59. And so we're, we're doing stuff. And for this to have only been in, in place in 2022, uh, it's moving right along. We're doing a really good job with this. So what can the provider do? You know, we, we at Passport Molina, we have a team of case managers, but how do the patients you know, get to us. Sometimes they get to us through the screening that we do with our with our new members, but we also have a way that our providers can also help us uh, screen these patients. So we want our providers to know that um, when you use um, social determinant of health screening, it's a very effective way to assess the needs of your patients. Um, so uh, a social determinant of health screener, uh, we're all, if, if there's not one already being utilized in the practice, there are several options that, that we can, can give you. Um, there are, uh, there's the accountability health communities related social needs screening tool that we have on our website for providers to use. We also have um, the prepare um, experience that, that they can look at as well. So, it's very important that we let our providers know that they need to include the appropriate social determinants of health codes with their diagnosis, and it will greatly impact how Passport Molina will identify and assist the enrollees that have these social determinant needs. Um, you can also just directly as a provider make a referral 
to uh, the case management team. And most of our patients know that they have a case manager and who that case manager is. Uh, and they can share that with us and we can be the go-between sometimes, or sometimes the, the patient will wanna make that first contact with their case manager. But, and again, right there, simply make a referral, just send a brief email to care management, Kentucky at passporthealthplans.com. Uh, so here's a story how it all comes together. Sarah, not a real name, of course, young woman. And a year and a half ago, she had a pituitary adenoma. She was told that she only had a few months to live. And she's been through several treatments, uh, chemo and, and things like that to treat her tumors. But there's more to Sarah than her uh, pituitary adenoma. Uh, we think Sarah, uh, as a whole person, we want her dental and her vision issues um, taken care of as well. Um, so, and her mental health issues. So we have um, the remaining teeth that she have are pushing into her tumor and uh, a lot of pain with that. Not that, and the adenoma itself is already painful. So this swelling has also caused her glasses to break when she tries to fit them on her face. Um, Sarah was also admitted as a behavioral health to a health facility for suicidal intentions. And she got uh, treatment for that, for her depressions and her feelings of hopelessness. But while she was inpatient, um, a referral was sent to our uh, transition care team. And we had a 30 day program uh, so that Sarah could stay home safely and be monitored at home. So Sarah and her uh, transition care coach set goals together, uh, which kept the depression symptoms stable. And other things that we wanted to do all over was improve Sarah's quality of life. So she wanted to have her teeth removed and so that they wouldn't press into the tumor anymore. And she, they didn't know where to begin. She didn't have reliable transportation. So her transition uh, care coach, we were able to find a surgeon just a few miles from her home uh, where she could get a ride from family members. And after the consultation with uh, the surgeon, she was able to get that appointment, have her teeth removed. Uh, so Sarah graduated from transition of care program, and she continues to work with our case managers to achieve the rest of her personal goal. Next step, dentures. Uh, using the value added benefit that Passport offers. Her care management team will help her walk through this process, hopefully as easily as we helped her walk through uh, the behavioral health issues uh, and the extractions. Um, her goals included in her individualized care plan are what we're working on now. So improvements in Sarah's quality of life and continued focus on, on her future uh, oriented goals may help to add invaluable time to Sarah's life actually and give her and her elementary school aged daughter more time with her mom. Um, and again, hopefully um, we see the importance of interprofessional um, workings that we do at with our case managers. And I am very proud to be Dr. Sherry Babbage, Melissa's Way, Dental Director, Passport Molina. Thank you. Thank you very much for that good report. Um, I got a, a question. Uh, where I'm at, I'm, a, I'm about an hour and a half drive from the Louisville airport, you know, probably a good hour uh, hour and a half, hour and 35 minutes or 40 minutes into, you know, downtown Louisville. But, um, uh, and I know you said that you all just started this in 2022, but uh, we see a fair amount of passport patients in our area, but we, um, I, I had no knowledge of the, the denture being as part of a value added benefit. Um, were you um, all going to send anything out to the, um, providers or or did I miss something in the mail um I would have to let one of my um that's not uh, uh, anything that I'm aware of but uh as far as I know every every passport provider should have gotten this information um and if anybody's on my team that has that answer I would appreciate that and if not I will get that to you the answer and and for our our other uh, providers as well. This is Kimberly for Molina. Um, I'll double check and see what communication went out. I can't answer that at this moment, but I will double check and, and get back to you. Thank you, Kim. 
question. Okay, any there, other yeah. questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, at this time, let's go with uh, Aetna. Hello, good afternoon. Okay, just a moment and I will share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see the presentation? Yes, we can. Great, perfect. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tristan Moore. I'm the director of the population health team for Aetna Better Health of Kentucky. All right, so at Aetna, we take a, a total approach to healthcare. You know, our goal is to empower enrollees to achieve optimal health healthcare outcomes and quality of life by addressing their social determinants of health and giving them this, the skills and tools um, to navigate their healthcare. We understand that where our members live, work, learn, play affects these health outcomes. So our innovative integrated system of care approach is based on uh, the whole person view of the enrollee's physical health, behavioral health, oral health, health literacy, functional needs, and SDOH. Um, we recognize that all these aspects um, of these needs are woven together and often in unpredictable ways. Um, this, the com enrollee's complexity is driven by their unique physical and behavioral health conditions and social determinants of health factors. So these next few slides, I won't spend a lot of time going over these. They're more just for you guys to take a look at. Um, these come from so a platform called Socially Determined, um, which is a social drivers of health risk stratification platform, um, provides some features to look at community level risk stratification and mapping individ individual level risk stratification and insights, including mapping and key community asset overlays. This slide in particular um, provides a visual representation of Kentucky's population and social risk at a community level. Um, you can see the different categories here for residents at elevated risk. Um, economic climate um, is the highest among those categories at 40.6%. Um, and here economic climate means the community's economic opportunity um, and resilience represented by average area incomes, household, household size, and neighboring housing costs. So we'll go, like I said, through these a little quicker. This is all from um, the same source here. This kind of just breaks down the top 12 counties by inter, uh, state intervention rank. Um, so the top counties with elevated risk for financial strain, food insecurities, housing instability, transportation barriers, and health literacy. Um, the state intervention rank is based on the number of people that are at an elevated risk uh, for two or more of the five domains. And then it breaks out each of those um, risk areas, it gives you a visual representation uh, statewide um, of these different risk areas. The darker, area, as darker areas are the counties um, at a higher risk for um, these disparities. So the first one here is for economic climate. You'll see one for food landscape and housing environment, transportation, and lastly, um, health literacy. So at Aetna Better Health, um, we identify SDOH needs um, from a, a multi-source approach. So members are identified through our intake assessments, so like our HRA, um, contact assessments, um, healthcare equity assessments, um, and then internal and external referrals. So just a few quick statistics here uh, for 2021. Um, Aetna made over 18,000 um, or completed over 18,000 SDOH screenings 
Um, and this represents our general Medicaid and our Sky membership. Um, we also um, identified over 14,000 SDOH needs and made over 4,000 referrals. So here you see just kind of a breakdown of those SDOH referrals by category. And for the general Medicaid and Sky food, um, was among the highest, 30% for our traditional Medicaid and 16% for Sky uh, for those referrals. So now I move on to kind of intervention. So after you know we screen these members, um, we're looking at the data, uh, the needs of, of our population. You know what are we doing about it? At a Better Health, um, we tailor our services and our programs to Kentucky population health and social determinant needs, which to start is that internal um, social support team. So what does that look like? Across our organization from leadership to clinicians to enrollee representatives, um, it's composed of individuals whose responsibilities and past experiences includes working on integrated teams and gaining an understanding of physical health as well as the behavioral health, long-term care and other related social needs. Um, so that we can assure enrollees are connected to the appropriate resources and services. So this supportive structure encourages coordination at every level, assuring a team approach centered on the individual and their unique needs um, and leveraging needed resources to achieve those quality health outcomes. The teams that you see listed here are an integral part of that structure. So member services, staff are screening for those social needs um, related to enrollee status changes. Community health workers, uh, part of our population health team, they're an integral uh, part of the structure to meet the social needs of enrollees as they identify them through the member welcome calls, HRA, HRQ, uh, healthcare equity, and direct referrals. Our CHWs engage these enrollees, caregivers, providers, to provide those social needs support through in-office coordination or community connections. And then of course, care management takes on that member-centered approach and focus on community relationships, integrating those physical health, behavioral health, and social economic status of the enrollees. And then community development. Our community development team uh, works to establish those partnerships and build community relationships to help guide some of our initiatives aimed at improving the overall health of our enrollees um, and the communities in which they live. So I won't spend a ton of time going over through all the different kind of programs that we offer here at Aetna, um, but essentially um, our Aetna enrollee driven approach to value-added services and care management programs support our integrated care model. Um, through these programs, we can outreach to address potential gaps in SDOH. So as I had mentioned earlier, our top category for SDOH referrals in 2021 was related to food insecurities. So you'll see here that we have um, a value-added benefit for home-delivered meals. Um, in 2021, we delivered 39,000 meals, which equated to about 223 unique members who received those meals. Um, that's among several other programs here related to transportation, GED certification and job skills training, remote patient monitoring, prenatal post, uh, postpartum su support. Um, we have another program called Momentum. Um, this program is designed to empower the enrollees um, self-care by providing them a menu of specific services and supplies. Um, so qualifying members can have access to a pool of funds um, to use on certain items and benefits. Um, some of the examples of that could be funds to cover grocery delivery or um, other meal, meal delivery programs, uh, mobile technology to help manage certain conditions, utility payment assistance, and or dental services that may not be covered under um, their benefit. So overall, when we're looking at our value added benefits, um, the projected number of utilization for 2021 was lower than the actual number of benefits utilized, prompting some discussion around expanding those key benefits to additional populations. As it stands now, many of the benefits um, have eligibility criteria that are inclusive of certain geographies um, or subsets of the population. So this um, would allow us to expand um, those benefits to allow access to, to a broader member base. Uh, 
the next two slides here just kind of breaks down our community resource referrals. Um, the first slide is representative of, of our SKY members and the next of our um, general traditional Medicaid members. Um, you'll see in 2021, we had over 3,000 total community resource referrals documented in foster care events, equating to um, 1,154 unique members. So you'll see the various categories there of the types of referrals that we're making um, for our SKY population. Dental made up um, the highest percentage at 22%, um, followed by uh, behavioral health, and then SDOH was around 9% of those referrals. For our um, traditional general Medicaid, you'll see um, a little bit less referrals noted here. So just over a thousand total referrals documented, equating to 529 unique members. Um, SDOH did make up the majority of these referral types at 52%, followed by physical health um, at 21%, and then dental and behavioral health. Um, our SKY model is very high touch with each member being assigned a care manager um, with specific outreach timelines based on risk level. Um, so in addition to a better reach rate, the assessments used in this population are more robust and pro for a lengthier list of needs as compared to our traditional Medicaid popula population, which is kind of why you see that lower number of referrals. So our last few slides here um, are gonna talk just about some of our collaborative partnerships. Um, I've highlighted three here. So our, as I've mentioned, you know, we talk about this whole person integrated care. Um, our collaborative partnerships supports our organizational structure and culture to support that whole person integrated care. Um, so the three that I've highlighted here are Unite Us, Pix Health and Avesis. Um, through our collaboration with Unite Us, we aim to improve and realize access to community resources for their social needs. Um, we recently partnered with PIX Health um, to offer members companionship, connection, empowering wellness activities that target um, reducing loneliness and social isolation. So members can get real-time help finding resources or chat with their compassionate care team. And then through our longstanding partnership with Avesis, um, you know, we're continually assessing innovative ways to improve member health outcomes. Um, in the middle of 2021, we worked with Avesis to implement SCOH screenings for members who call into the Avesis Contact Center. And we'll get into some of those statistics over the next three slides here. So this is um, Unite Us. You'll see um, Unite Us, we had a total number of referrals of 615 with unique members referred 234 um, and a referral resolution of 46.8%. So members that participate in this integrated um, community based or this integrated model with Unite Us, um, it's a, a closed loop referral network, including all types of social service agencies, um, enrolling referrals for integrated services for physical health, behavioral health, SDOH, are triggered through multiple sources. There's no limitations on how enrollee referrals are triggered. Um, an example of that is our um, the HRA assessment, which we had to attempt to complete on 100% of enrollees within 30 calendar days of eligibility. Um, one reason you might see some of like this lower resolution rate here um, could be duplicate referrals or being unable to reach members. So as I mentioned, um, in collaboration with Avesis, we're getting those SDOH referrals for members. Um, in 20, we didn't implement this until mid-2021. We've received 11 SDOH referrals in 2021 from Avesis and four year to date in 2022, with the top, the top category um, of needs being transportation, food security, and access to quality services which typically means oral health needs not covered under their, their benefit. And then just to give you some statistics, statistics around our PICS Health Partnership, this went live in January of this year and we're very excited about it. Um, all members 18 and over are eligible to en enroll in the platform. However, we have some specific populations that we target um, and that's recent ED and patient utilizers, high needs um, as identified by our HRA or HRQ, and then pregnant or recently delivered members. 
Um, total, we have 155 members who have onboarded. PICS also completes some different various uh, screenings. Um, one of those is our depression screening, the PHQ-4. We've had 13 members complete that today and 124 members complete the UCLA-3 screening, which is the loneliness screening. 28.6% um, of those um, of which have identified SDOHD. And then the last slide here is just, again, kind of going back to the, from providers, what we can do outside of, um, you know, the Z codes and, you know, screening their own patients. Anytime you identify needs um, for your members, those referrals can be sent over to our population health management team um, or um, one of our care management teams, depending on if it's a Sky member or a traditional Medicaid member. And that's it, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Mark, I believe you're still muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. I, I got a tickle in my throat, so I muted myself. Um, well, I, I was starting to make a note there about your uh, the referrals that were resolved, and it was at forty eight or forty six point eight percent. And I was just looking at if, what steps that you all may be taking to increase that number. But uh, I noticed you one of the answers was you, you all had a hard time reaching back with the members. But um, do do not all of the members get free phones anymore or, or do they just choose not to answer the phone when, if they see your number or do you, do you know what's going on there do they just not call back or um yeah it really could just be a combination of those things um you know members just tend to be too difficult to reach i i know that unitas makes three attempts um over an allotted time to make that outreach and a lot of times, yeah, we're just not getting um, those either return voicemails or for being able to, to make contact. You know, maybe we're calling at a bad time. I know our CHWs are working to make some of those additional contacts out in the communities. And sometimes, you know, they're more available um, at various hours and can kind of reconnect the member, you know, once we, we circle back with them. Any other questions? Uh, if you all notice that in your chat section at the bottom of your screen, uh, uh, Ms. Aaron has asked that everybody that gives a report, if you could email or forward those on to uh, Aaron Bickers, and it's, it's uh, at ky.gov, but it's down on the chat uh, if you want to get the exact uh, lettering for sending these reports in. All right, uh, let's go with Humana. Hi, this is Kristen Mowder. I'm the Director of Population Health Strategy for Humana. Um, I'm going to be presenting. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay, can you guys see my presentation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so is it in the pre sorry, is it in the presentation mode or is it in the can you see the where it says no slides or in my No, we can see we can see the both slides at once, one big and one little. Okay, let me see if I can fix that. There she goes, she needs to do that. Um, did it fix it? Can you see the whole thing now? Or is it we still see your notes. Yeah, I think if you go up there to the display settings is where you need to go. Go where? I'm sorry. 
up at the top there, display settings. There you go. There you, right there. I think that's your option. I've done it twice and it doesn't seem huh. like it's. No, oh, it so. All right. Well, yeah, we'll just kind of go with it. Like, on a, how about that? On a whim, try the, okay. uh, the, mo the monitor on the bottom. Click on that and see, see if that takes care of Mine okay. screen went blank. <laughs> <laughs> what is behind the forehead up there, Dr. Kermio? Okay. I'm just going to go don't, ahead and. Don't listen to the orthodontist. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the first thing I want to talk about is our population health program. Um, so I, in addition to our care management program, we have a whole population health team. And so I was just going to kind of go through what the different aspects of that team is. Uh, so we have SUH coordinators, and those coordinators work independently to work with the members and also support our case management team on addressing the social determinants of health and, and promote that uh, prevention and health education. Um, and they, while we're doing that, they address um, the dental needs of the member as well. Um, they may help with finding a provider or refer to case management if it's more in, in depth uh, that they need more support on. Um, one of our next ones is our workforce development. So we have an employment coach that works with members who are having issues with um, finding stable employment. Uh, so they'll work with them on, you know, coaching, um, resume, all kinds of different things. Uh, the next program we have is our housing assistant. So we have a housing specialist that supports our members to find housing. Uh, to keep safe and stable housing and assist them with eviction, diversion services, and things like that. And then we also have our um, community health workers. So they do some of the same things that our SDOH coordinators do, but they also do have a hands-on approach. So they can go out in the community and meet with the members and help them navigate through the, the, the system and, and go to appointments with them and, and different things like that to help address their SDOH needs and things like that. Um, so some of the things that they do when they're working with the member is they also do the prepare that you heard about earlier in one of the previous presentations that, you know, kind of assesses for the SDOH um, needs. And then on top of that, we, we do a preventative screening. Uh, we do that with our adult and pediatric population. And in that preventative screening, there's a couple questions that do um, – talk about the dental health. So the questions are, have you seen your dentist in the last six months? And then what problems or concerns with your, your mouth, teeth, or ability to swallow have you had or did you have? Uh, so those are just kind of a couple of examples of some of the questions that they ask. Um, in our case management program, they also ask questions around dental health as well. All right, so the next slide is to kind of talk about our comprehensive care support model. And so as you can see, we have our care management and our enrollee um, in, this, in the middle. And then you have our whole support of our case management, our community health workers, our medical directors, our housing specialists, our pharmacists. And then on the other side, you have all the community support. And we work as a, a team, a care model team, like it kind of says in the title, uh, to try to pull all those pieces together and to support the whole member for all of their needs. And then the last thing is um, we just wanted to, to give a success story around our um, population health team. Uh, so we had a referral for a 63-year-old member who was referred to our housing specialist by our case management team um, who was having some issues. Um, the member was on a limited income and had some health concerns. So some of the barriers is not having sufficient income to pay for ne needed repairs to their house um, to make it habitable. Um, inability to pay for utility bills due to the fixed income. So the intervention, the housing specialist assisted the member in searching for different um, community resources that could assist the member to repair with their home repairs and financial assistance on the back pay of the uh, utility bills. Um, the member stated that he didn't want to lose his home. Uh, it was going to be the cold weather, was struggling, was, had high gas bills, 
um, all those kind of things. So the member was on the fixed income, like we talked about, and then a rural area and was having problems finding that those resources. So the results of the housing specialist was able to um, work with the member, locate resources, and obtain a $9,660 grant um, that helped with the, the home repairs. Um, due to the roof repairs being uh, completed, the member was able to remain in their home. This process took about a year to complete, but ultimately some of the other repairs were not completed due to, due to the COVID pandemic. But the member also received assistance in paying for those utility bills and, and got caught up with those. So those, that's just kind of like an overview of our population health program. Um, I'll open it up if anyone has any questions. All right, well, thank you. Thank you all. And uh, I wanna thank everyone that uh, made a presentation today and at our last TAC meeting. I know it, it takes a lot of time and effort to, to put these things together. And, and again, I want to say thank you for a job well done. It kind of helps give us TAC members some, you know, some other a broader uh, scope of what you do and, you know, help and, and the factors that are social determinants of you know, that it all plays together. Um, uh, Dr. John Gray, did you finally get on? He said he did. But... He was on. I, uh, he was driving, Mark, but um, he was on. I don't see him now. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm getting a buzz on the phone. Let me see here. He just put the letter Y on there. Um, let me. Okay, he just texted me, said he's on. Can you ask him to turn on his camera, please? Okay. He says it's not working. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to see if he can get on here in a minute. Um, and I had not heard, I know I did talk with Dr. Julie McKee. Uh, and she was not going to be able to be on our meeting today. Uh, and the report that she was working on is not quite ready, you know, for distribution yet. But she was not able to be on here to give us any kind of brief summary. Um, is there any other old business that we need to bring up? I've got one item um, that uh, and. And boy, I hate to have to admit that I think I made a mistake um, or, I, or I failed to, uh, uh, to, to finish up on something. Uh, I had a note to uh, send a, uh, uh, some of this, uh, it was a long motion that we made last time. And I, I don't know if I ever, I was asked to send this to Miss uh, Charlie and I, I don't know if I did or not. I'd have to look that back up, but. I'm thinking I did not send that to her, but do I send that to uh, Miss Aaron now, or who who do I send this to? It was yes. a motion. You would send stuff to me. Are you okay. talking about Mac recommendations or just yeah? It was a, the uh, the the one we had was for DMS some reports, um, and uh, I think I I think I messed up. I hate to admit that, but I did. Uh, Anyway, uh, we could, I can send that to you, Miss Aaron, and that'll be okay. Yes, sir. Send it to me and I will follow up. Okay. 
Oh, and I got the note there. I even put a sticky note on it to flag that rascal. Um, let's go on to, uh, uh, to new business. Um, I'll, I'll just, and I know uh, uh, a couple of things that are, I wanted to just talk briefly about, you know, Medicaid fees and reimbursements and um, the, uh, I've gotten several, some, some data. Um, this is talking about the uh, general fund receipts from April are generally up from last year. Uh, but I, my main first question is, is um, and this might be go to uh, Angie, I'm not sure who to direct this to, but just uh, does, does the cabinet for health and family resources, do they, or services, do they uh, go to the legislature or do they go to the administration and, uh, and ask for any additional funding or, or how does that work? Lee, do you want to take this one on? Sure. Um, hello, it's Lee Geis from uh, Policy and Operations in Medicaid. And if you'll give me a second, I'll let you, I'll put my face on camera so you can um, see. Oh, there we go. And I have to turn the camera on versus the mute button. So the uh, the process is um, each individual department within the cabinet works with the cabinet's budget office, and they put together a a budget request uh, from the cabinet that includes all the departments. So like the Office of Inspector General and the Department for Health and the Department for Behavioral Health, et cetera. Medicaid is included in that. Then we have, uh, that information goes to the governor's office and our budget is part of the governor's budget request because we're part of the executive branch. The governor's budget request then is worked on uh, and every cabinet submits their budget request and I'm sure everybody else does. So then the governor's office works on their budget bill, what they wanna request from the legislature. Then the legislature, the governor submits that budget to the legislature. And then uh, I think that you saw recently, uh, the legislature has to go through several steps and then they pass the budget. Does that, does that answer your question, sir? Yes, that helped a lot. I just, uh, I, I just didn't know the mechanism and that even if you all were allowed to have input into that budget making process. Um, so thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're um, welcome. The, um, this, uh, you know, what I've got here, this is from May the 10th on general funds report. Uh, said there was an 80% increase of revenue since over last April. And it was mostly from individual income tax. Um, and this is a six, oh, it, I'm not an economist or an accountant, but it just, I don't know how all this, I'm just going to read some of this, but it was a, the 16.4% year to date growth rate exceeds the 7.2% budgeted growth rate for the current fiscal year. Um, sales and use tax, uh, even though they fell for the month, they are still, re for April, they were still re recording the third highest month ever. Uh, corporate income, limited liability entity tax, LLET, uh, some of y'all will know what that is. And, uh, it continued to be strong and increasing at 29.7%. Individual income tax collections grew by 80.7%. Uh, uh, um, let's see here. The motor vehicle use tax collections fell 18%, but are still on pace to be one of the second best fiscal years ever. 
So, you know, uh, I, we, we just, and sometimes when we talk to legislature, legislators about, you know, uh, our, the funding for Medicaid, well, it's, they, I just keep it, well, we don't have any money. We don't have any money. Well, these reports that I'm getting are, tell us different. Um, and, and I don't know if, you know, we're not pushing the right buttons or not getting the right help, but um, I know, uh, you know, dentistry hasn't had a fee update except for the other a few months ago on, on eight codes, you know, for 2002, um, that's, that's 20 years ago. And a lot of dental offices are just, I mean, I'm, I'm getting a lot of phone calls and text messages of, of how they're struggling. And I know the reports show that you may be getting some more uh, members to, to get online, but then I, I hear a lot of members are limiting their access to care. And I guess this is the, the thing I worry about is, is access to care. Uh, the, uh, let me go, here's a, uh, a report um, from the state of Virginia. The state of Virginia used to be one of the top Medicaid, uh, I mean, that was the go-to place to look for Medicaid, uh, how to do it, how to uh, get reimbursements. And now they're 48 out of 50 in their uh, Medicaid uh, status. Um, there was a, uh, here, here, this is here, this is one, a good one is the issue in, in this, they were 16 years without an increase in reimbursement rates. Virginia's Medicaid Smiles for Children program has gone from the nation, from a national leader to one of the programs with the lowest participation rate in the country with reimbursements and participation well below neighboring states. And uh, they, they said, they even mentioned Kentucky that, well, they're even, you know, now they're even below Kentucky and West Virginia, Delaware and Washington, DC. Um, and I mentioned there were 48 out of 50. Um, but I, I'm just, what I was looking at was what kind of incentives are out there for a Medicaid, for a dentist to want to become a provider? Uh, and the, another question is, and uh, whoever from the state can help me answer this or give me some guidance, like, and I don't know if, some of y'all were at one of our meetings six years ago or seven years ago. Um, I asked the same question, what carrots are out there for the dentist to continue? Now, John just texted me, Dr. Gray, um, that they've, they've lost two front office staff in two weeks. Uh, a dentist up in Campbellsville texted me yesterday, said, do you know of any assistance out there that can help us? Um, um, my hygienist is off for a, a shoulder repair. And we've, we've put two or three weeks ago, we've put ads out there, ha have not got the first bite of, of somebody to come in and help us. Uh, so staffing is becoming a real issue. Um, and, I know I'm supposed to be talking about Medicaid fee and reimbursements, but it's a. Um, I was talking with somebody this morning about the the uh, and earlier about the perfect storm of problems, um, but let me find the ADA paper here. Garth, while you're looking at that, I I think it's also. I mean, we we consistently talk about the 2002 only changed since 2002 being a reduction in fee, let alone the, um, an, an increase. And then during the pandemic, obviously we had the added cost for PPE and those issues. We understand that's outside the control of everyone because it is a global pandemic. That's been exacerbated by not only inflation, but also targeted inflation. Um, I'm sure in your office, we've seen it in ours and, and in, the, in the dentists that we discuss it with, 
a box of gloves going from four dollars and twenty nine cents to nineteen dollars and change for a single box of gloves. Um, when you're looking at a three hundred, four hundred, in some cases five hundred percent increase in material cost, and yet we're we have practitioners out there that are that are treating this population, but they're doing so on the margin. As we see that, we see practices and. And, and John's is one of them that that it's it's becoming uh, budget negative to try to continue to treat with the current fees. Beyond that, to ask any new providers to join is not uh, it is is quite a challenge to do. But um, as the the whirlwind of not only added costs with pandemic issues, but now the uh, inflationary costs in, in all of dental. Um, and all, frankly, all of medical spending makes it even more challenging for all the practitioners to be able to 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 continue at the, at at this pace and to continue with the cases. We're overwhelmed with patients, but we're underwhelmed with uh, the ability to 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 cover those patients with the reimbursement that we have. No, I got it. Here's a thank you, Doctor Joe. Uh, this is another. Uh, uh, sheet that I've got here, just that the, the governor's budget fully funds the Medicaid program, ex including the Medicaid expansion. Um, the uh, but then here's another one says, well, the ex they Medicaid has extended the reimbursement rates for for nursing homes. The now, and I'm the chairman of our local uh, health department. And, and we did get, it says substantial funding of $17.7 million for fiscal year 2023 and 19.1 million for fiscal year 2024 uh, is in the intent for the public health transformation. Um, and, and I'm on our local health board and all, you know, it's like everybody needs some money to, to keep functioning. Um, and, and it's like Dr. Joe said, it's like what what carrots are out there for any dentist to want to be a Medicaid provider, knowing that the costs of what we've got. Uh, and I see uh, a lot of these the reports uh, that were given. There's all kinds of benefits for being on Medicaid, and and I'm, I don't begrudge anybody for that. You know, and I know the MCOs are making their money, but the dentists are flat going in the hole trying to see the Medicaid population. Now, here, here's another issue. I've got a, a, a memo from an oral surgeon, and he's, he's actually gone on public uh, media to ask people to quit sending him Facebook messages and messenger contacts to be bumped up in his list of, uh, you know, trying to get people in earlier. They, one of the Virginia, um, there's a, a Virginia dental clinic had a waiting list of over 200. This one oral surgeon said he has a waiting list of over 400. And he said, I, I just, He's just asking the public, please quit messaging me on on Facebook and Messenger because I there's people ahead of you. And you know, he can only he's just one man. And he says, I'm the only oral surgeon in over a hundred mile radius. And I can he said, I can only do so much in a day's time. Um, so what I guess what I was looking at to summarize this was access to care. And, uh, and and reimbursement rates is the number one complaint that I get from uh, dentists and their dental offices on on just making ends meet. Um, and and I and I wish we could work together with you know the administration and the the folks at at the cabinet, you know, on on seeing what we can do to get some better reimbursements. Uh, and I just heard that uh, Indiana just got a fee update. Virginia's looking at that. Um, I got some papers here on Georgia. Dr. Zabrowski, 
Yeah. Dr. Wabrowski, let me chime in. This is Ronnie Coleman from Benavis. We support um, Ruby Dental. Um, so you may recall that during the last legislative session, we tried to work with Senator Alvarado to encourage a policy change that would have allowed Medicaid to draw down more money so that they could increase Medicaid dental rates. Unfortunately, but the bill passed out of the Senate Health Committee, but stalled in the Appropriations Committee. Allegedly, it was only going to cost like five to seven million dollars. And he said it would be like a 70 or 80 percent match. And unfortunately, the legislature didn't see fit to do that. But from what I understand, and I heard this from from people within the legislature and elsewhere, that that's literally something that can be done by the cabinet. You don't have to pass legislation for that. So that's one thing we tried to do to try to be proactive to see if you could increase rates. But to build on what Dr. Bobrowski was saying, I'm responsible for a bunch of states. I was literally, I just got back from Maryland about three or four hours ago. I was on a, a, in a similar meeting to this one yesterday uh, where we had a lot of Medicaid interest, the providers, advocacy community and so on for a good reason because we are trying to figure out how we're gonna spend $20 million that the governor, Governor Hogan put in his budget to increase rates. They had an increase rates there significantly for, I don't know, been 10 years. But this year they were able to pass the creation of an adult Medicaid dental benefit, which you already have. And separately, they put $20 million in the budget, which is mainly due to the efforts of myself and a few others. Um, to increase rates. And so what we're looking at there is, do we focus on some key rates or do we do across the board? But they, they, they're they making an effort. Indiana has not. Indiana is in a position where they, it, they're they probably gonna have to significantly increase dental rates next year because when they created their adult program, they, they reimbursed for adult dentistry 30% more than for kids. They do that for physician services too. I don't remember what, they did it to get uh, providers to, to participate years ago. I don't know how CMS approved that, but now CMS says they're out of compliance. And to fix it, what I'm hearing from people in the know is that ultimately this year, the state's gonna have to submit a plan that's likely gonna raise, significantly raise uh, reimbursement rates for the kids program. They're gonna have to, and then the legislature is gonna have to pass it next year. So there's going to be something there. Virginia, as Dr. Bobrowski mentioned, uh, is way behind. They haven't seen a rate increase since 2005. And we had a lot of support there from the department and one of the chambers to, for a 30% increase. But unfortunately, the new House majority and the new governor, <laughs> they, they decided to squash the 30% increase recommendation, drop it to five. But it doesn't even matter because their legislature still hasn't decided on the budget. They adjourned a month and a half, two months ago, and they're still squabbling about what their budget's going to look like. So we don't know what's going to happen. But I will say in Georgia, another sort of conservative state, this year we were able to get 15 codes increased by 7% and two extraction codes by 10. And what's special about Georgia is they're set up a lot like yours where the MCOs run everything and they contract with their dental benefit administrators. And they, the dental benefit, or I should say the MCOs, take money off of that fee-for-service reimbursement, just like in Kentucky. Well, the positive is every year, the legislature considers some kind of rate increase from the dentist. It could be anywhere from 1% on like 10 codes to 3% like last year on about 15 codes this year, 7%. And that money, when it's passed, flows through. So they're doing something every year to try to help their dental providers. And I'm just amazed that Kentucky has done, literally, well, I'm not gonna say that. Obviously, I'm very thankful for what Avisis did in terms of their advocacy with their MCOs to increase rates on those eight codes last year. So thank you very much. But as Dr. Joe was just saying, I mean, the costs that our practices are incurring are staggering. I mean, I looked at some of the numbers. The, the workforce costs are up, supply costs are up, rent and leasing is up, everything's up. Patient show rates still the same, but they're busy. We're, we're busy, but we're losing staff. I think our staffing is down 
50% or more in our four offices in Kentucky because we can't afford to compete for talent with people who aren't, you know, aren't completely commercial, who are, who are commercial oriented dentists. We're mostly Medicaid. And so I'm, I guess, asking, I'm sure this is what Dr. Bobrowski is doing. What is Medicaid thinking about? What are you going to do to try to support your Medicaid dental providers? I understand not wanting to, you know, increase rates every two or three years, but it's been literally what, 20 years, 20, 20 years, 20 years, not, not counting, of course, the, you know, the, the thing that Avisis was able to, to put through last year, which was helpful, but in the whole scheme of things, you know, it's just not, it's just not enough. And so, I mean, do you have any answers, uh, folks from Medicaid? Uh, I'm afraid I don't have any answers for you right now. Certainly not. Um, make a, 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 you know, recommendation and talk about some of your ideas about what you would like to see. And uh, we can take it to leadership and to the MAC and see what we can come up with. Um, I, I hear you. I hear you. Um, and I think everybody at Medicaid does hear you. Uh, I would, uh, Mr. Coleman, I would ask some of those people who are telling you that uh, legislature doesn't have to pass anything for us to have a larger draw uh, to ask what they mean. What's the authority for that? Um, because that was my understanding. Now, I'm not a budget person and I don't know all the ins and outs, but my understanding was that the, it's the legislature that holds that key for us about uh, how much we can draw down. The appropriations amount, I think, is the, is the right uh, wording for that. So perhaps you can ask for that. Uh, you know, what do they mean we can draw down more money without even asking uh, for the legislative authority? Um, it's our understanding that the legislature is the appropriations branch of government and they're the ones who make the appropriations. So we have a, you know, we have certain limitations that we have to deal with. Um, That's a good point. And what I'll, what I'll say is this, what they meant, what the people that I spoke with, what they said was it didn't have to be initiated by the legislature. It could have been something initiated by the governor's office, by the department. And so Typically, and I don't necessarily know how well the administration gets along with the legislature there, but I do know that oftentimes when things start in the governor's budget, they have a better chance of passing through. I know that's not, again, that's not always the case, but I think that's what they were talking about was that it didn't have to be led by the legislature, it could have been led by the administration. Uh, so that hopefully will answer your question. And as far as suggestions going forward, I mean, I'm sure I, Dr. Bobrowski and this, his team can uh, come together on, on some ideas for codes that need significant attention, whatever. I just, I'm sure if he, he takes it to the MAC, they'll agree, yeah, something needs to happen. But then what, what happens from there? Where does it go after that? The department, okay, so let's just, Let's just say that you that the dental tech makes a recommendation to the MAC to uh, uh, give a 10% rate increase over all dental codes uh, beginning and pick some date. Okay, we'll do a physical impact on that and see if there's any money in the budget and see where uh, that can, whether, you know, we would come back to the MAC and say, okay, that'll cost, you know, whatever it would cost. And uh, there'd be a discussion about it. If there's no money in the budget to do it, then there, then we would talk to the MAC about that. The commissioner would speak to the MAC about that, about how to, you know, to make those requests. They can't, uh, when I talked earlier about how we make our budget request, we don't go to the governor and say, we have to have this. We send our budget request to the secretary, the secretary works with their, but all of the cabinet's budget 
and they send all the budget requests over to the governor's office along with all of the other cabinets and their budget requests, the governor comes up with a budget and submits that to the legislature. The legislature is the one who makes the decision about what is passed in the budget. Uh, our governor is a Democrat. Our both legislative houses are Republicans. Uh, they managed to override uh, most of the vetoes that the governor issued this year. So um, I think, you know, that those are just facts. And, and that's all I can tell you about the facts. And very little, I know that uh, I can talk about budgeting all day long, but I don't really know very much more than what I've just said to you. So if you have specific questions that you want to talk about, we can try to make sure that someone uh, from our budget office uh, comes to the meeting. If you can put some questions in writing that you'd like to know, uh, they can be prepared to come and talk to you about something. Um, I'm sorry that I can't offer you any anything else than that. Uh, and that is my dog moaning, not me. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Lee. Sometimes it just, you know, we, even though we've been on the tack or around this for a few years, it's just sometimes we still don't understand the full, you know, flow of, of things. And, um, but I, I just want to, you know, I, I keep bringing up this access to care. Um, y yesterday, I, uh, I had a lady call our office, uh, you know, from Bowling Green. And depending on what part of Bowling Green she lives in, I'm, I'm, I'm probably a good hour to hour and a half drive. And she said, I can't get in. I'm hurting. I'm getting, I can't get in anywhere. I, I said, I could get in July the 16th. Now, would, would you want to have a toothache until July the 16th? So we, we told her, I said, load up and come on. And, uh, and then I got a text from another MD late yesterday afternoon. Um, one of his nurses uh, from an, from another county uh, texted, "Would you would you be able to see somebody tomorrow?" Well, uh, I'm technically I'm I'm off today because of uh, I've scheduled these meet several meetings and uh, um, had this TAC meeting scheduled this afternoon. I said, "Well." Uh, get get down here, you know, seven thirty or just as soon as you can this morning, and and we'll see what we can do for you. Because, I, like I said, I didn't really have assistance or anybody here, but uh, with the office was open with uh, my other, my son who's a dentist, but they had their staff and their patients already booked up. But anyway, I went ahead and and saw her, but she said I I can't get in anywhere in two counties around where she was from. Um, and, uh, you know, this, uh, she's a nurse that works at this other MD office and the MD, you know, text me. So I said, well, just come on. So we, we got her in this morning, but I'm just telling you, there's, there's an access to care problem across the state. Um, and I, I, I don't know, we'll just have to keep plugging at this and, Maybe the TAC can, uh, you know, come up with some ideas and, and have some, you know, again, it'll be, you know, three months or so before we can make a, an official vote on anything. Um, but we'll, we'll just see what we can bring to the TAC. The TAC can bring to the, uh, make the recommendations and vote on that, and then it'll go to the MAC. But uh, we're, we're just kind of looking for some advice and some help, but... Um, you know, the access to care is, is getting very problematic uh, with general dentists and oral surgeons and, and just a lot of offices are having the added problem of staffing. Um, so it's just a, a report out there. So I'm going to move on to other new business. Um, and uh, I Darth, have, Darth, yeah. Darth, before you do, can I piggyback on that and just yeah. to say that uh, one of our top refers in our Somerset office is in Bowling Green as well. And they drive an hour past you to come to me. So yeah. they've got a, over two hour drives to come to me because no one is accepting them 
um, with Medicaid. And, and as you know, orthodontics is one of the most highly controlled aspects of the Medicaid plan. There's We only see the worst of the worst conditions, and these folks are driving from Bowling Green to see us. So that access to care is, you know, I, my heart is in East Kentucky because that's where I'm from. That, that's where two of our three offices are. But, uh, but, but it is spread from east to west with an access to care issue. On top of that though, John is on the, on the call here. Do we have a quorum with the three of us? I, I think Miss Lee or, or Andy, correct me if, if he's not on video. They he's won't... on video, Garth. Is he's he on, on video. okay. Yeah. All right. The, the question that I have is, Miss um, Geis, that I, you know, I, I have been on this TAC and I have been attending TAC meetings. Um, I can't tell you how many years now before I was actually on the uh, on the on the committee itself. And I have uh, obviously a, an inability to keep my mouth shut. And I apologize to everybody for that. But um, but what was said, I think, is one of the most important things that that has been said by you today in what this TAC can do. And that is, if, if we have quorum, I would suggest we, we make a motion to request a 10% increase in, in dental fees across the board um, to, D, to, to, the, uh, to the MAC from DMS. And if we have quorum, I would like to, to see if we can get that motion passed because as we all know, these governmental motions are are, are slower than steering the Titanic with good reason. But if we, if we wait, then, then we're waiting more. So I would, I would make that motion now. Do, uh, do I need to go back and establish a quorum or, or can I just say that, well, since Dr. John Gray is on here now, we do have a quorum. But he is not showing in the populated six, screen uh, mr coleman he, can you turn your he's camera john's off? ipad he's well, john's ipad he's wearing a blue shirt and something glasses uh, yes sir but I, to, I, I, if you can scroll to the right you'll see him. i do see him however i have to have all three of you on camera at the same time in the screen see. for the youtube so mr let's see if i can hide because i removed mine let's see here if, if he says, I've got the three of if, us on mine now. And if he's just pull it down, let's see here if I can. That doesn't work. Oh, okay. I see him there. Dr. Gray, can you turn your microphone on? Maybe that will populate you in as if you were going to speak. I apologize. I'm not trying to be difficult. I just want to make sure that we're all legally covered. If he will unmute, and I'm texting him right now. Uh, uh, if he'll unmute, that'll bring his video up to the top. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can see all three of you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Dr. Petrie made a motion uh, that we we do have a call it, we do have a quorum, so we've got that established. Uh, but uh, Dr. Joe Petrie has made a motion to. Uh, increase all dental fees across the board 10%. Now, discussion. I'll second the motion and we got it. Now we got discussion. The, if, if we had a 100% increase across the board, just we would be at, at less than 50% reimbursement rate. And 10%, you know, for our practice, I don't know that that's even a stopgap amount. Maybe it's all we can get. Maybe it would help someone somewhere. But but we're losing money every time we see the patient for one, two, three extractions. Every single time we're paying to treat the patients. And we can't. Uh, everyone wants $15, $17 an hour uh, when they walk in the door. For We just, we cannot continue with a 10% increase, 20% increase, we are we are so far behind this that it's it's going to end up there's going to be absolutely no care. You talked about driving two hours. I've had patients this week from 
the West Virginia border, Ohio border, Tennessee border, and Illinois, Missouri border from Paducah, Kentucky, because nobody else will see them. Ten uh, percent, we'd be glad to have ten percent better than nothing, but it's 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 a joke to even suggest anything less than one hundred percent. That's all I have to say. Well, John, if you if you wanted to uh, uh, amend the the motion, uh, or, or Dr. Joe could allow a, a, a friendly amendment to your motion of, of, of a different percentage. Well, continuing in discussion, I would I would I absolutely wholeheartedly agree with you, Dr. Gray. But I I I do think that any motion that is at a hundred percent or more is is going to fall on deaf ears, and I. I feel like we uh, we need to consider what is reasonable and realistic. I don't know that that ten percent will even be heard, um, but I am I'm certainly uh, would be willing to increase the, the 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 requested amount. Part of my goal is to see what can come back from DMS from from a study evaluating what change that would make. But uh, continue with discussion. What what would you all be acceptable with? more than 10 less than 100 to take to uh to take to the mac uh as a as a request a lot i think that's a question for medicaid uh and the social services we are expanding the governor has expanded medicaid services by providing more services at but the ones we're having are inadequately funded so yeah. I think you're right. There's no way they'll do 100%. I'm open to anything. What? Why don't we just put in the motion then of, uh, um, I'd say, 30 or 35%. And, and even at that, that's uh, like I say a lot. I, I've just gotten letters from all of our dental suppliers. They, they wouldn't even put it in their letters how much they're going to increase their costs to us. I got a letter from our laboratories for dentures and stuff that, uh, you know, the fees for the laboratories are going up. And some of those were in the 15 to 25% range. Um, um, and I'll, I'll just to, to go back on, uh, on the passport Molina, uh, I, I know you all had the, the service of making uh, the dentures, uh, and uh, it was $350 or $700 for a full set. Um, uh, one of our lab people uh, told us, he says, I, I will not even make one of those dentures. He said they're of such poor quality, such cheap teeth, that they, they won't even hold up. He says, I won't even make them. If a doctor asked me to make them, I won't even make them. Uh, so, you know, you get what you pay for, but uh, but I, I would entertain at least to go up to 30%. 30% um, you know, Garth on a $40 procedure is $1.20. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go for 30. And I'm sure I won't be asked to unmute again. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Joe, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you, John, and, and I'm and I'm I'm fine if we want to go to 100 percent and and let let DMS's calculations uh, show what can what is and what is not acceptable. I would I would love Miss Geis's um, input on 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 that as well because if 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 our feeling is is if you shoot for the moon and you or shoot for the stars and you end up on the moon you're a heck of a lot better than where you are, but my only worry is if you shoot for the stars and you never leave the launch pad, that's that's the worry that I have with going at such a high rate. Would Dr. Gash, would you have a comment on that? Uh, it's just Lee. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Uh, I don't, uh, you, you make the recommendation at the level you feel is appropriate and uh, our budget and our financial folks will do an estimate based on what your request is. 
Uh, it's not that um, the amount at this point in time, I, that it was my understanding that what we needed to do for every provider group, because believe me, it's not just the dentist or the orthodontist um, who are asking for more money. It is, um, and it is incumbent upon us to let you know that, that we get a dollar and we spend that whole dollar and we try to spend it, uh, uh, you know, um, with good stewardship to provide the best care for the, everybody that we can. And, and so that's why I'm talking about going to the legislature and asking them to appropriate more money or to appropriate money uh, specifically for dentists um, would be another way to go because if the legislature tells us to do something and they fund it, then we, can, we will do it. So I, I don't think that we would ignore you if you ask for a 500% increase, but uh, there, there might be some eyebrows raised at that point in time, simply because. Uh, otherwise, uh, you ask for what you think that you need, and uh, we will do a physical impact on it. Um, if you want to see what the cost might be, uh, you can always go uh, ask for a, a couple of different. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't go 10, 20, 30, 40, all the way up to 100, but uh, you might ask for what the fiscal impact would be for a couple of different percentages and include 100 if that's uh, Dr. Is it Dr. Gray? Yeah, if, it's Dr. That, Gray. Lee, yeah. and one, one more quick question. Has there been any other group, hospital, pharmacy, uh, nursing homes, uh, any other social work, any other thing that, that is in under DMS? that has not had a raise since 2002? Are we the only ones? No, sir. Physicians, the physician's fee schedule has not been updated uh, since 1996. And, and that, that physician that called me, protected me yesterday, they told me the same thing. <laughs> Our fees are so low, we, we can't hardly keep you know, doing this, but. It's like you use the, uh, the the reference to the that you get a dollar and you, and you you have a good steward and you and you spend it wisely. The the our problem is is that our costs have gone up so high that we we may get a dollar, but it costs us two or three dollars to provide the service. Yes, and sir. I, I understand uh, about the cost rising because I too live in the world, and so. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, yes. So I, I'm with you there. And, okay. and I hear you. It's just that it's not possible for me to say, well, yes, uh, we would be happy to and we'll be able to increase your fees. Um, I, I'm just trying to give you some ideas and some thoughts about uh, ways to go about finding out what it would cost, how much it would cost and what you can ask for and how you can ask for it. And certainly, uh, I want the MCO representatives to hear that. Lee, I have a quick question. Um, do you know if the physicians get the full fee-for-service schedule reimbursement, like what you have printed on your schedule, or uh, do, do the MCOs take from them as well? I am not privy to what anybody uh, is paid by the MCS. Sorry. The contracts, this is Angie with Medicaid, the contracts with the MCOs are negotiated separately. We do not get involved in contract negotiations between the uh, provider and the MCO. Excuse me. Let me get one. John, as a point, you may, John, as a point, you may want to look at what oral surgery alone has been because the 2002 date is an important one. But I do not believe the orthodontics has been changed since 1984, and I'm not sure that oral surgery got much change in 2002. Uh, yeah. Uh, whatever, Joe. Whatever you want to put in, let's let's put it in and. I'm fine with, you know, 
maybe start at 50. Let's start at 50 and make a recommendation and see if we get any traction. I'm not sure the difference is in orthodontics and dentistry as opposed to physicians is they don't have to buy supplies. And, and probably 50% of our overhead is supplies that we have to buy and increases and we have to use. So we're in a, we're in a highly uh, competitive area in terms of supplies on one end, which are going up astronomically and, and controlled rate on the other, which is quite different than a lot of other, a lot of other things. Hospitals, we're all suffering. Everybody is, is underpaid with, with what's going on with this massive inflation. So let's, I'd say let's ask for 50% if that works for you and see where we go. Dr. Joe, so Dr. Grabowski, yes. I, I would agree to amend the motion to a 50% increase. Okay, any other discussion on that? Um, all in favor say aye. 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 And no opposed, you pay unanimous. So we'll, um, we'll, we'll pass that on to the MAC and then uh, we can see what the uh, MCOs can come up with in the state and uh, we'll just try to keep this, this going. I'm, uh, like I said, it's just it's getting to the point of access to care and, and being able to, you know, financially stay open um, because of staff turnover. Uh, I guess that's a Monday night. I got a text of a, a dental office in Elizabethtown. Just had to shut the whole office down. Can't get staff. Uh, so it's, it's a real problem out here um, just to stay alive out here. But... Uh, Okay, uh, anything else on fees and reimbursements? No, I would just add that I, I, I hope, I know the people on this call understand it, but I, I don't know beyond the folks on this call how much it understands that this system is, is on the verge. When we have some of the best practices in the state, one of them in, in Somerset that takes a tremendous amount of care in their patients, is is now telling patients they cannot schedule them. They can call in the morning to see if there is an opening because they cannot schedule them because they're overrun. It's it's we're on the verge of, of collapse with this. And I know it's it's I know it's it's everywhere, but I think that I appreciate everyone taking the time every three months to have a discussion that seems to be a lot of the same discussion over and over. But I'm I'm very pleased that we are putting forward this to the MAC because I think it's probably the best thing in the last decade that I've seen come out of what, what we have tried to do. Thank you, Dr. Petrie. Um, I'm gonna move on to uh, other new business. And I had a note from the last meeting that uh, uh, Ms. Parker was gonna present a, a focus study done through DMS, the uh, external review organization of social determinants. Um, Ms. Angie, do you, and I, I know I had that in my notes and I did not ask you for a report or even if you had one ready earlier and I'll, I'll just ask you now, or do you want to do that at the next meeting? Well, I think I, and I'll have to go back and check, uh, but I believe I sent that to Aaron, the last meeting, but I will double check that to share. If not, then yes, please, I will I will go through it next meeting. And okay. I will double check my records that that was sent out and I will resend it just to make sure you got it. Okay. So Aaron, make sure I send it to you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, does, does, under new business again, does are, are you all prepared yet at any, to give us any information on the new program that uh, we got some emails about this week? It's the basic health program um, and can, how it concerns dental. And, um, and, I, and I did send in a, a, a list of questions um, and, uh, and, I, and I printed off the, uh, what we got on the email the other day. Um, but I still, I still had a few other questions, but is there anybody that is able to talk about that program at this point? Cause it's, uh, due to launch in November 
and the effective date will be January the 1st of next year. Yes, yes sir. sir. Go ahead, Angie. No, you go ahead. Nope, I'm done. <laughs> uh, I can speak to it on a very high level and, and pretty much what you received uh, is what it's all about. It's, um, it's kind of a, a bridge between Medicaid and what you would call a qualified health plan. Uh, the marketplace and where um, for those people who will not be eligible for Medicaid but fall into that one uh, 138 uh, uh, FPL to 200 percent would be eligible to uh, uh, apply for the basic health plan and we are looking uh, meeting with issuers which are also called MCOs to see who will be offering this uh, at that time. Yes, we are working fast and furious and, and ensuring that we can get this um, program up and running for personnel to uh, get enrolled. That's it on a very high level. I do have some, I did receive your questions. The questions that you sent in the email box uh, does go to me okay. and I will be uh, sending those questions back to you once we finalize the answers. Okay, that's fine. Um, I just I thought, well, since we've got our TAC members here, it might be good to you know, give them an overview. They, I'm sure they got the same letter I did, but just uh, I didn't know if you had anything new that wasn't on the sheet just yet. So, um, well, thank um, you. Not really. Now, if you have okay. any, any other questions that uh, while I'm here. Um, I may not be able to answer, but I can certainly get them to you. Do, do you all, uh, one of the questions was, do you at all know that, the, does this have to go through the uh, Department of Insurance for Kentucky to, or is it just totally DMS, CMS or? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, the, the Department of Insurance, because it is, uh, would be in some involvement with the oversight of the managed care por portion of this. This is not what you would call a, it's kind of a hybrid between a, med, a Medicaid and a, a qualified health plan. It follows more rules from a qualified health plan than it would Medicaid. Okay. So there won't be a fee schedule like there okay. is with Medicaid. The, you would be contracting specifically with the uh, MCO, also known as an issuer, which you will probably see that word issuer a lot more than MCO. <clears throat> you know, will they will they be offering some type of um, knowledge on what their reimbursement will be before they sign up a contract or? Well, that will be between you and the, the, the issuer on what you agree to contractually. Can you answer this? If you can't, just say no. <laughs> I'll, 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 I will. Uh, just uh, do you know which MCOs or are there other new MCOs going to be involved? Or Well, at this point, uh, it's not been finalized which ones there uh, ha there have been a couple that have said that they will not at this point but uh, it, it doesn't go through the RFP process like it does for Medicaid MCOs okay are there any other questions on the basic health program All right. Uh, is there um, any other new business to come before the TAC today? Hearing none. Um, Dr. Bobrowski. Yes, yes. Since you have your quorum, did you approve your February minutes? Oh, I missed yeah. it? I've, I've got two notes here and I missed both of them. Uh, we, uh, yes. Uh, uh, 
need to have a motion and a second then to approve the minutes from the uh, February 11th meeting. I can make a motion to approve the minutes from the February 11th meeting. Okay, thank you. I second the motion. All right, all in favor say aye. I second the motion. All right, thank aye, you. Aye. Aye. Okay. All right, that passes there. So we've got that done. Um, and I, I, and I want to thank our TAC members for, uh, I know sometimes it is difficult with all the other stuff going on in our offices and our lives. It, uh, I appreciate y'all taking the time to get on our, our TAC meeting today. Um, the, uh, the, the MAC, well, the next two things, the, uh, uh, at the next MAC meeting, uh, I've already made arrangements and plans to attend this. It's May the 26th at uh, uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time. So I'm, I'm planning on attending that. Um, the MAC recommendation, uh, we voted on that a few minutes ago. So I'll be bringing that before the MAC uh, on May the 26th. Um, any other questions or comments about the, uh, the MAC? Hearing none, our uh, next meeting will be August the 12th. Uh, again, it's a Friday afternoon, and I'll bet you it'll be 92 degrees and sunny, and we'll all want to be kayaking down the river. Um, but is there any other business or anything we need to, else to bring up at this meeting? Dr. Bobrowski, this is Nicole. If I could just ask one quick question, please. Yes. Um, in regards to future meetings, do you anticipate that any will be in person just to in, in an attempt to try to prepare for travel arrangements if necessary? We, at the last meeting, we voted to carry on this year's meeting as a Zoom. Perfect. Um, and then hopefully then we'll have a meeting there in, in November and then we can, I guess, take a vote at that time to, uh, um, you know, see what we're going to do uh, starting in February or at, at the next meeting. So we'll have three months of time between the November and the February meeting to help with uh, time for those travel arrangements. And perfect. So if that's can, I, okay. can I make a motion? Can I make a motion that we travel to wherever Nicole's background is because that's where we need to have. <laughs> This next meeting. I wish I was there. <laughs> yeah, I saw that a while ago. <laughs> uh, all thank right. You. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, again, I want to thank everybody for uh, being on the on the Zoom call today and appreciate your attendance and comments. And um, anytime somebody needs to speak up, we'll just Try, try to let me know. Now, there's one more little button showing on the chat thing here. Um, okay, I'll, I'll email the recommendations uh, prior to the MAC meeting. I'll get that done. Um, so we'll do that. So, all right. Doctor, I'm sorry, Dr. Broski, I did have one other thing. There was a question at the beginning of the call regarding the provider relations representatives. Um, I do have a list of all of the uh, all of the representatives with Avisas. Um, we are staffed, so I'll forward that over to Erin so she can get that over to, to everyone. Okay, thank you. Nicole, thank you. I found out today that, that we, we have been uh, contacted uh, in our office. And Great. And the it's, I really appreciate having the actual contact. So it's, it's yeah. great to have somebody in the, in the position. So thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, we will adjourn this meeting at this time. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Have thank a great you. weekend. Thank Bye. you. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Where are you flying to, John? Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.